Hi folks, Helmet. Um, so, the first and most uh, simple point that I want to make um, is that helmets are very, very important things. Um, for those of you who like movies, um, uh, you will probably be annoyed by something that I'm often annoyed by, and that is that there are lots of people in a sort of medieval or fantasy kind of setting, or other periods indeed, uh, when helmets were also worn, um, and, and the heroes are often not wearing helmets. And we all know the reason for that, it's because you want to see the nice, um, nicely flowing hair uh, and be able to easily recognise your, your hero of the, of the movie. But the fact of the matter is, uh, if there is one piece of protective gear, protective clothing that you are going to wear in an environment where things might be exploding or weapons might be flying around or people might be trying to kill you, the one most important thing you can have is a helmet, okay? Uh, it might be a simple helmet, it might be a tin hat, like in World War I. And we all know the famous um, statistic of the fact that um, people dying as a result of um, getting hit in the head by things plummeted after uh, tin hats were introduced into the British Army. And of course, um, other militaries uh, did similar, similar things. The French did the same, and, uh, and of course the Germans in fact already had um, helmets quite early on. So um, the fact is that helmets save lives and even when you're talking about modern sports or indeed something like cycling for example um, back in the 80s not very many cyclists wore helmets and lots of people fell off bicycles, bumped their head on a curb or a lamppost or a car and probably died or, or soon after died um, or went into a coma um, because of concussion and, and brain damage. Okay, It's incredibly easy to um, kill or very badly um, injure someone with a relatively light blow to the head and certainly just falling over and hitting your head on a rock or, or on a tree um, is enough potentially to end your life or certainly ruin it and those of them, the life of your family as well. Um, so the fact is head protection is very, very important. And if people are swinging weapons or shooting weapons at your head or other bits of your body, then having something protecting your head is even more important. So, um, helmets, very, very important in the um, ancient periods, um, right the way through the Dark Age into the medieval period. Um, and in fact, even once we get into the gunpowder age, um, helmets were retained pretty much as standard um, certainly through the 17th century and were really only phased out um, hard helmets this is, really only phased out towards the end of the 17th century um, although still retained by certain types of cavalry, cuirassiers for example uh, and replaced um, for infantry and other types of cavalry by certain types of hat and it's interesting and important to note that some of those types of hat are themselves very protective. Um, the, the, the famous Lancer's hat with the sort of square mortarboard on the top, uh, quite good at protecting from uh, downward blows from sabres. Um, and in fact, the, the bearskin hats, of course, that um, hussars, some, some types of hussars wear, and certain types of infantry wear, uh, are quite protective from sabre cuts. And in fact, um, certain types of um, bearskin hats um, actually had um, iron hoops. I believe French hussars had um, iron uh, rings inside the hat to protect their heads a bit more from cuts. And then also you'll notice sometimes the, the chin straps that come down from these things sometimes have scales on the metal plates to also protect a little bit to the size of the face and, and protect from the uh, hat being or helmet being cut off. And um, a, a Another type of head protection that uh, the British Army came into contact with in India, for example, uh, was what we would call the turban, um, or puggery, as it was actually more commonly known at the time. And um, if you look at pith helmets, often um, they have a, a, a sort of wrapping around them, and this is a puggery. It's usually silk, um, certainly for those who can afford it. Silk is very, very resistive to cuts, quite protective material, and of course uh, the traditional turban or puggery worn uh, around the, the hair, you'd have long hair underneath wrapped around your head, and then the puggery on top, and this was noted to be very, very resistive to sabre cuts um, uh, during, during various wars um, in India in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, and there were such tactics used, and these are detailed in D.A. Kinsley's book, for example, uh, such, such tactics as 
thrusting the um, uh, turban off in order to get the turban off so you could then um, cut the head with the sword. Um, so various types of um, protective gear for the head were worn from simple wrappings of cloth obviously through to certain types of hat that may look ceremonial but actually offer uh, a decent level of protection and then uh, through tin helmets of course in the first world that introduced in the first world war uh, which continue to be worn thereafter and in the modern day of course have been replaced by Kevlar helmets uh, which can protect um, from certain certain bullets from certain certain firearms although not all uh, and a lot of shrapnel as well and that's the important thing also to say that helmets are not just there um, to protect you from someone actually trying to hit you in the head with a weapon they're also there to protect you from bumping your head like falling off your bicycle and of course if you're in a combat zone and running around avoiding bullets or avoiding arrows or spears or whatever environment you're in um, you're probably more likely to fall over, you're probably more likely to hit your head on doorways or, or bits of um, masonry that are lying around, um, or in fact, you know, um, fall onto a weapons that are on the ground. So it becomes even more important to have head protection on uh, for that reason as well. And then lastly, of course, there's the, the shrapnel effect. There are things that are just flying around in the air as a result of um, warfare, um, whether it be arrows and, and slingshots and things like that, or whether it's actually shrapnel from explosions um, or you know pieces of masonry uh, during a siege, for example, if you've got siege engines shooting at, um, at walls, bits of uh, stone and, and bits of rock and wood falling off things and hitting you on the head. And, and you know the, we talk about uh, the effectiveness of different weapons. Well, actually. Falling over and hitting your head is, is a fairly sure way of, of killing you, or a very common way of killing people, even today. And of, of course, something falling off a, a, a ledge and hitting you on the head is equally likely to, to kill you. Um, so I'm just going to put the helmet down. Um, I want to finish off by um, talking about a couple of things in uh, relating to English medieval history. Um, the first is Henry V. Um, so some of you will probably, probably know this. Um, but uh, commanders, it was very important that commanders and, and knights and every kind of soldier really, every kind of soldier that could afford it, wore head protection in the medieval period in a war zone. And a famous example of someone perhaps neglecting their uh, head protection or perhaps raising a visor or perhaps taking a helmet off is Henry V. Um, and when he was fighting the Welsh, uh, before he was actually king, when he was, when he was a prince, um, he actually received a longbow arrow to the face um, and this probably seems to have happened while he was either talking to one of his commanders or perhaps drinking or perhaps just getting his breath because he was hot um, and maybe he'd lifted his visor or maybe he'd taken his whole helmet off, we don't really know um, but he had a longbow arrow that hit him in the face luckily for, um, for the English at the time he didn't kill him um, uh, and in fact his surgeon, the royal surgeon, had to invent a special uh, device to extract the arrow safely. Uh, but he did have quite extensive scarring on one side of his face, uh, much like Sir Richard Francis Burton incidentally. Um, and um, so there we go, there's a good example of a high profile um, royal in this case, high profile medieval person uh, getting seriously wounded, could have killed him because they neglected their face protection in an area where there were arrows flying around, okay? Um, and I'll just briefly touch on this, I'll probably mention this more in a later video. Um, it is worth noting that in medieval art, visors are normally shown down, or very often shown down, when forces seem to be advancing uh, towards the enemy, i.e. the period of time when lots of missile weapons are likely to be coming your way. Uh, and equally when approaching uh, fortifications, castles, and, and uh, during siege warfare and such like. However, it's also very notable that during close combat, uh, during the melee, you often see the visors up. Okay, so um, it is clear that during the medieval period, very often people did choose an open-faced helmet or um, just lifted their visor up once they were in hand-to-hand -hand combat because what you lose in protection, you gain in being able to breathe, keep a bit cooler when you're wearing full plate armour, um, it, it gets very hot, um, and of course being able to see. 
and being able to see is one of your methods of defence. Um, and um, I have armour, I will talk more about armour at some point. And from my uh, limit, relatively limited experience of doing things in armour, with visor down and visor up, I find that certainly for fighting on foot, visor up, although it's obviously dangerous and you don't normally do it in a modern recreational um, context, visor up gives you so much more visibility um, that it's very advantageous. You can see all of your opponent, you can breathe freely, um, you can see what you're about to tread on, you can see, you know, you can see down all of your body and you can see if there's anything lying on the ground or uneven ground that might trip you up. Whereas with a visor down, your vision is really much more limited. Um, and uh, the final thing I want to mention is the Battle of Towton. So, uh, 1471, um, 71 or 61, uh, I'll have to check that. Um, but, um, uh, Battle of Towton during the Wars of the Roses, um, uh, thousands and thousands it was, uh, of people died. It was one of the biggest casualty rates of any uh, battle on um, British soil. P some people would argue the most bloody battle uh, of British history on British soil. Um, and uh, lots of the skeletons from the Battle of Towton that have been detailed in various books since have head wounds. Uh, and in fact, the recent Richard III skeleton that was discovered also had head wounds. My, and the same is true of the Battle of Visby as well, 1361. And, and my personal take on this is that the vast majority of medieval soldiers by this date um, would have been wearing head protection. Um, in, uh, certainly if they could have any protection at all, head protection would be the first thing they pick. Um, so my natural inclination, on, I'm not saying it's true in every case, is that when you get medieval battlefield skeletons that have head injuries, I tend to think that these are people who have probably not received the head injury as an initial injury. Perhaps they've been knocked to the ground and their helmet pulled off or cut off if they've got the strap done up um, and been finished off with a blow to the head. Or in some cases, executions of prisoners like we hear about at the Battle of Agincourt. Um, or, or other explanations like this. I don't think, generally speaking, that with professional soldiers, or even most levied soldiers during the, the late medieval period, the 14th, 15th century, are most of the time going to have head protection and therefore not going to get head wounds or head cuts and piercing wounds usually as a result of weapon injuries because their head protection, the helmet, is going to protect them uh, hopefully nine times out of ten. Um, so there we go, some things to think about. I'll probably talk some more about this topic uh, at a later date. Thank you.